Hello. Good evening, coaches. I see a lot of people are starting to show up. We'll wait a few minutes to get started, make sure everybody's got a chance to be here. Uh, just be aware, if you've never done this before, if your microphone is on on your computer, we can hear you and everything going on in your house. Uh, we certainly want to hear you if you're trying to, uh, to contribute. Uh, but Otherwise, just uh, do your best to, to mitigate, I guess, any background noise that might be coming on. There is a mute option. Um, I believe it's on the top of your screen. It's on the top of my screen. Um, but thanks for coming, and I look forward to getting started here in the next couple of minutes. For anybody just showing up, uh, we're going to wait just a couple of minutes to get started. We still got people uh, piling in right now, um, but looking forward to having everybody on and uh, and participating tonight. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was outside, I guess. I don't know what that. This song is All right, anybody got me? Can everybody see the, see my uh, both my screen and my video? Or yeah, me? yeah, you good? All right, good. Yeah. Guys, I appreciate you showing up tonight. Um, this is the second time we've done this. I'm not going to tell you that the first time was pretty. Um, but I, I think we had a good talk, had some good coaches on, and um, and had an opportunity to uh, to talk a little bit of ball. Um, I know everybody's probably uh, getting a little bit bored. I know most of us are stuck at home, or at least primarily at home. So I, I uh, wanted to create this this opportunity to get everybody involved. Um, as a reminder to the guys that are just joining us, um, you know, if if you have not muted your screen, we can hear everything that's going on behind you. Uh, you know, as far as the format of tonight, guys, um, I'm going to kind of get us started and kind of guide our direction to begin with. But ultimately, um, I want you guys to feel free to um, – I want you guys to feel free to speak up and add. If there's something I'm doing that you think I can do better, man, I want to know all about it. Um, at the same time, if, um, if you're doing something that you think some of us can learn from, whether it's with the scheme, with the way that you're teaching it, uh, or with your drill work, um, let us know. So for those of you that I don't know, my name is Pete DeWeese. I'm the offensive coordinator and quarterback coach at uh, Sprayberry High School in Marietta, Georgia. Um, I have coordinated really all three phases of the game, coached a lot of different uh, positions, and I've been very fortunate to learn from a lot of good coaches. Uh, last Friday night was the first one of these. We kind of focused on stick and snag. Uh, that is available on the website that I've created this week in my downtime. Uh, if you're interested, I encourage you to go. I'm, I'm posting some old articles and some things I've written on there, and I'm going to continue to upload uh, video as well. I want it to be a place that coaches can go and, and find good information, not just from me, um, but re really from anybody. Um, so, you know, as far as tonight goes, guys, um, you know, like I said, last one we did, we focused on uh, snag and stick. Tonight we're going to focus on zone football um, and talk a little bit of run game. I'm a guy that was born and bred as a power scheme kind of guy and um, in, in a gap scheme guy. But the more that I've coached football and as, as, as defenses have gotten better and evolved and become more multiple, the thing about zone to me is that you can teach it to kids. And if they pop up and give you a different look in the middle of a game, kids are going to – they're going to easily be able to adapt. Um, you know, if, if you can commit full-time to being a gap scheme, that's fantastic. Obviously, there's wing T programs that do it. Um, I've coached in, in, in a pro-style offense where, 
you know, it's probably 60% of our run game with some version of power. Um, I, I love coaching that offense, but I've really, um, really gotten comfortable uh, coaching zone and calling zone as a play caller. Um, so tonight just kind of wanted to get some guys on here and, and talk about that. Um, so uh, welcome to everybody. And I'm just going to kind of start by walking you through our process, what we do, um, and, and why we do what we do. Um, and then I, I know uh, I know we got some dudes on here that, that really understand outside zone, and I'm excited to hear from those guys um, in particular. Um, you know, we were an inside zone team when I got to Sprayberry and, and took over that offense when our whole staff was brought in three years ago. Um, we, we were going to hang our hat on inside zone. We were not great. We were far from it. We had gains that we had to make up in the weight room. We had gains um, from a knowledge standpoint. Uh, where we really felt like we had to improve. Um, and, and we felt like zone was a good place for us to start. It was something that the kids had a basic understanding of from the previous staff. Um, so we, we really focused on it. As time went on, though, uh, even though we had some success running inside zone, um, everywhere you look, everybody's got a different version of it, a different way to run it. And I thought that defenses had started to get better at being able to defend it. We started seeing some athletic ends in our league that could squeeze the quarterback and play both. And if the quarterback pulled it, they could feather back out and make the play on the edge. Um, but, but if they were good enough on the inside and better than us, and a lot of teams were, um, they could really get those ends if they forced the give as well. So we transitioned from an inside zone team this past year to an outside zone team and had um, – quite a bit of success. We had a, a tailback rush for nearly 1,700 yards, um, and they did it behind five really good offensive linemen and a really hard-working, aggressive tight end. Um, but the transition to mid-zone for us really, we felt, made us more versatile in the run game and, and really gave us a place to hang our hat. Um, so I'm going to real quickly – talk you through mid zone and how it looks from our standpoint. And then we're going to kind of transition from there. Um, you know, what, what we call mid zone, we sat down with uh, trip Allen. A lot of you, I know are Georgia coaches. Um, we sat down with trip Allen. You may know him. He was a longtime offense coordinator at Walton high school in the Atlanta Metro area. He's now at Brookwood high school in Gwinnett County. Um, and, and trip has done a great job teaching and, and running the, in, uh, the mid zone for a long time. So we, we sat down with him, and, and quite honestly, what Alex Gibbs calls his wide zone and what we call our mid zone are very much the same thing. Uh, the difference is we do so much of it from the gun um, and not under center like Gibbs did when he was coaching in the NFL. Um, but for us, we're going to set our aiming point um, at the outside leg of the tight end. So for us, if you can see my screen right now, um, when we work our mid zone concept, and we're coming from the sidecar position, we're really setting our aiming point at that outside leg of the tight end. The truth is most of our snaps this year of mid zone hit backside a gap and never got out into the waterfall. And a lot of that had to do with just the structure of the defenses that we were playing and, and what they were kind of focused on, on taking away. But we feel like mid zone is a very versatile scheme um, we use our same mid zone blocking rules. We can run it to the tight end. We will also bring the tight end back across. And uh, for a defensive end, is it like a slice concept? We will bring the tight end back across and insert him on the backer. We can put the tailback on the same side as um, as our tight end. Run mid zone to the weak uh, to the weak side where we're either using him in the the tight end in the RPO game or using him um, to help seal the backside or to work up to the backside uh, linebacker. Um, so we, we, we have a lot of versatility with how we do that. It also gives us a lot of versatility from a formation standpoint. We are primarily um, an 11P football team or at least we have been in the past. Uh, we're kind of trying to figure out who that is going to be for us and what that body uh, type is, is going to look like for us. Are there many coaches on here that run a version of mid zone or what you call mid zone? Speak up if, if we've got any fans in the house. I'm the only one, man. At, at, at Liberty, we run it a little bit different. 
Thank you. Coach We're Kaso. a big mid zone team. He, he, introduce yourself real quick, guys, as, as you speak. Coach Queso, if you'll go first, then Nick, if you'll follow him. Yeah, guys, uh, my name's Trey Queso. I'm the offensive line GA at Liberty. I was the offensive line at West Georgia two seasons ago. Um, the way we're going to do our mid zone, it's just going to be a little bit tighter. Um, now, the way we'll run outside zone is we'll aim just for a little bit like what you call mid zone. Uh, but the way we're going to run mid zone is we're going to run it at the first down line and pass the center. So, if the image shown on the screen, Coach, you're going to be – your aiming point is going to be at the three technique. Well, we never want to have our aiming point necessarily at a defensive lineman. Okay. Uh, what we're going to do is – excuse me, but we're going to use the ass crack of the guard, of the yep. place of the guard. Yep. Basically, the running back's always going to make us right. Yep. Uh, and that's our – that's just the way we do mid zone. We run it this way because the problem we were having with inside zone is we just didn't. We don't. We won't run a true inside zone. We'll run a tight zone, which is going to be a little bit different. But that way, with our mid zone, we can get the stretch we want uh, with how we're doing things. Where where does where does the mid zone hit for you most of the time, Coach? The mid zone for us, a lot of the times, what we do is. It really depends on where the linebackers are. So, at the end of the day, if they're gap sound, it's going to hit right inside of the guard. If that right. play five linebacker is stacking that interior D lineman or post it over, then we're expecting movement, and then that's when we're probably going to bounce something to the outside. Right. Uh, but we rarely let it bounce outside the tackle. <laughs> We, we we were able to get ours outside, particularly we were getting a, just a traditional What's that? trip set, three by one with the yeah. dub set. And, um, and and we were able to get out into D-gap and try to make a corner tackle, which is, you know, something obviously we want to make the, those guys try to tackle. Um, but but we, ours typically is from front side C to back side A, and those are probably the two most common gaps. We'll get some front side B, some front side A, but it's a lot of front side C, back side A. Yeah, uh, uh, Nick, go ahead. Uh, introduce what? yourself. As a child, yeah, I'm, I'm Nick Melandis. I'm the running backs coach at Clay Chalk uh, High School in Birmingham. Um, we were again? very similar to y'all. Uh, we actually – Run it away from the tight end more than there's than no such thing as a child, end, but we were always our aiming point for the running back was outside leg. Why don't you pay the attention on the line of scrimmage, whether that's the tight end or the tackle or um, a sniffer back? Uh, we're always telling him outside the last man on the line of scrimmage, and then he's not allowed to make his cut uh, until he steps on that guy's whoever that last man on the line of scrimmage is. Until he steps on one, you have a really want to push that wide, and then most times for us. It actually hit, um, you know, like I said, we run it away from the tight end, so it hit in B gap for us. Um, block that, block that tackle out right. again, and then just hang it up in there. Um, one other wrinkle that we would do a lot of is we would actually leave the one tech um, and leave him unblocked and let our quarterback read. It. We were pretty blessed, had a pretty athletic quarterback. Um, so yeah, they would basically go there and there, um, block that at, at end out, and then if that tackle, uh, that defensive tackle, that one tech wants to chase the running back. Um, then our quarterback was just going to pull it. Um, so that was just kind of a little wrinkle that was that was really good for us. Okay, uh, two things. One, just as a reminder, coaches, if you're joining us late, glad you're here. Um, this is an open format. Do want to hear from you. But if you're if you're not talking to the group and you have not hit mute, we do hear everything going on in the background, which sometimes is good for a laugh. But really, the big thing is sometimes we just don't hear the coaches that are talking. So uh, try to be conscious of that if you don't mind. Um, so let me ask this for the guys that, that, that run mid zone. One of the things that we like about it is we're able to keep our combos intact. And we tell our guys horizontal is fine, vertical is better. So, you know, for us, if, if we were, you know, getting this kind of front, to be honest with you, if we got this look, we probably would just keep running it all day. But um, we would actually – get it a minimum two combos um, and, and really get good vertical push, which is one of the reasons our mid zone is able to hit inside as much as it does. Do, do you guys teach more of a zone track scheme or are you identifying and trying to work combos and get vertical push in your mid zone? 
so what we're trying to do, um, Coach, is, is we, uh, we tell our guys two things. We want to get either vertical push or horizontal displacement, Yep. one or the other. So very similar to y'all, we want to engage those double teams. And if we can't push our guys vertical, uh, we want to we move them out of the hole, uh, whether that's horizontally or vertically. Um, but, but we do want to establish push. And, and if we can't get the push, we want to horizontally displace them. Mm -hmm. Coach Caso, are y'all the same way? No, we're, we're going to be a little bit different. So in our mid-zone thought process, obviously our aiming point is a little bit different than yours, but our footwork up front is going to be lateral vertical. Uh, we want to get both. Our main goal is to get movement and width at the same time. Obviously, depending on the strength of the interior lineman, we'll sometimes have to go to a technique where we call a torque. Uh, yep. Or we're just physically launching. But obviously, you have to move. So for us, in our philosophy, in any run play we do, we have to move the down lineman first. That's the main goal. So if we're running it to the right right here, say the tight end, he can do whatever. We're taking – all of our guys are taking lateral vertical footwork. We're all going for a spot, but we're playing games with the play side to cut the defense. Okay. So it's zone footwork up front, but we're working to somebody. So in this look right here, we would work the center and right guard up to that play side linebacker. Mm -hmm. All right, so we're always going to use the leverage of the linebacker and the calls we make. All right, that center is going to check that right guard, that play side guard, he's going to check his inside. If that, if, if that three technique is playing to the outside, he is he's now gone. working up the track to the backer. Yep. But one thing we won't do is, even though we're working to that linebacker, say, say we got a situation where – you know, we got split flow action and they're squeeze and scrape team. If that linebacker displaces himself backside, the center's not chasing him. We're going to the third level. Yes. So we're never chasing anything. I think the problem is for us, what I've noticed, if you tell the guys you just want to give vertical push, they're never going to take that first horizontal step. And therefore, you're just going to get a bunch of things clammed in the middle and you're never going to get any stretch. And the thing that I like is we want the running back to have as much room as possible to make a decision. And if you just kind of have a bunch of shit in there jambled up at times with just a true vertical thought process, the running back's going to have a harder time planting his foot and going. Right. Uh, you know, I personally, I think one of the most important blocks other than the three technique, it has to be that play side tackle. That play side tackle – if he's getting swallowed up or if he's not getting any push whatsoever, the plays really stop because then they can just box it in. Right. And then that safety right there becomes a free tackler most times. Now, so you said earlier, Coach, your tailback, essentially you're going ass crack of the place I guard against this front. What yep. is, is he just reading the guard's butt or nope. are his eyes second level? Nope, his eyes, are set. his eyes are on the first down lineman past the center. Okay, so in this case, he would be reading the three technique, aiming yep. right at that guard's butt. Yep, that way he's always right. So say that three technique wanted to slant in, it's just a smooth process. We're working up. Now the center would overtake the slant, and that guard would just work up, and that's how we replace everything. Yeah. And we have different calls if they're not gap sound pre-snap where we can protect ourselves play side and backside to cut the defense. Uh, and we'll do different things that way. That way we, we try to put ourselves in a situation where we're always right. I, I, I can understand that. And, and I, you know, we, like I said, we, we, we treat it differently than you do, but our thought process is the same as we have to be right. And, and it, at your level or the high school level, we all know, you're going to see a dude across from you that's just better than you are sometimes. And that's one thing that I love about what we do is I can control, and really my kids can control how we're going to block the dude. Um, so, you know, for us, like I said, um, we're working for combos here. So we are always with our center against an even front. If there is one defensive lineman that is just flat out um, better than the other, whether he's at the three or at the shade, we're going to make sure we combo him 100% of the time. So for us, um, you know, we would come out and we would actually let the play side guard. He's going to set the chain of command for our entire offense here if we're running our mid zone to the right. So if, the, if he's got the dude across from him, the guy that he knows 
he needs help with, he's going to make a cage call, which for us signifies the center and the front side guard. So yep. once he makes that cage call, we know we're working here. And he once he declares the cage, the center is going to declare what backer they're working to. Um, the cage is automatically going to give the front side tackle and the play side tight end the uh, freedom to, to now combo and work to any overhang defender. Um, but the cage also tells everybody on the backside you were by yourself at this point in time. So that, that left guard is going to be working hard to overtake whether he's a shade or an inside eye. Um, and the backside tackle is going to work flat looking for anything that crosses the guard's face before clearing up to the backside backer. So in this case, our center would set his combo to the front side right here. And, you know, we're going to do something, whether it's with the quarterback's action, RPO, or even motion to hold this backside end if we're not going to account for him with, with one of our tags. But what, what, what this has allowed us to do and the reason that I, I've liked it so much, and honestly it's one of the things that I've struggled with in the past when I've coached inside zone and outside zone, is if I get an under front, you know, or if even if the, the, the stud is working that backside shade, I do not want my center working with that three technique anymore because in my world of Jimmy's and Joe's, I got to make sure I block their best player. So we're going to set our combo here. So once that front side guard realizes I don't got the dude, I got the other one, you know, he's going to make a solo call. And once he makes the solo call, the center knows I can go backside and work what we call a cab, center and backside. So now they're working this combo. He's working up and not going to chase, probably looking backside for something folding in or a third-level defender. And we can still keep a combo on the front side to the to really to the front side backer is who we now, would end up working to in that situation. Now, if you're doing in that situation, my only, my, my only thing against that is with that safety placement right there, they have you guys outnumbered. It, on paper, they do, for sure. What 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 we have found is, and look, I, I we had some really good players last year, and maybe I'm going to tell myself I'm stupid at the end of next season. Part of it is our action being here. We're we're it is highly unlikely that we're going to get outside the D gap where that fitter is going to become a major factor. What is more, you had a like, lot of fast flow from the back. Side, we get a, exactly, Coach. Yeah. We get a ton of of we get a ton of um a ton of fast flow and let, let me I, I can show a couple clips real quick and then we'll we'll kind of move on and and go from there ultimately and, and high school kids being high school kids th there's no question obviously we're backed up here um and we give them a tight end wing situation so for us and i, I can't see here we go um our wing should be out on him this is game one it's far from pretty right here man we should be working there um and then, you know, based on the call of the front side guard, he either called for this combo or if he thinks we're getting the spike here, he can call for this combo based on, again, personnel and tendency and, and work there. And now we're working backside. And what becomes crucial for us at that point is how do we handle that cut off that backside four. Um, but you can see, you know, this obviously – we have a, obviously a higher probability when we're in the pistol or under center of hitting C gap or wider when we are in, um, you know, when we're in sidecar, obviously it's a lot more likely to have been back, but even here you can see that, you know, our, our right tackle gets stood up right away, but we're able to get the movement on the backside. But just like coach, like, just like you just said, we get so much fast flow from the back path that we get a natural bend and cut back um, pretty early. You know, here's from the sidecar. This is a, a, a 20, 21 P type formation so we've got a grounded tight end here we're going to motion him out of the backfield give the quarterback an rpo um out on the perimeter right here and you can see we, we knew against these team this team the best three players on the field were the uh were the defensive linemen uh we weren't very concerned about the overhangs 28's a good player um so we you know we we worked hard on uh, the nose and 28 in particular, and just felt like if we could cut off mm -hmm. the backside of the other guys, that we'd have a chance. So you'll see right here, we're solo here. These two are working a tag. So that's our front side tackle guard combo to here. 
we're going to cab for him and we're going to look to cut off on the back side now and we're you know we we tell our backs we'll we'll do what we can with rpo and with motion and play action and different things but you're going to be byob um on, on that safety a lot so be be ready for it um you know so here again you know it's high school film it ain't always pretty but you're able to see what we're able to get with the center and the uh center and the left guard we're able to take it over backside backer flows over the top and we're able to get an explosive play um but you know the, the beauty of, of of what i like about our system and what our offensive line coaches kind of developed was you know if, if we got in a situation where this is the better player and we're starting to get a four i or something here we can we can we have the ability to just change our combos and to, to simplify things for our kids and they got really good on the field you can see it here same deal from sidecar same defense same blocking rules there's no tight end now still working the tackle the tag on the front side we get a good cut off on the back side and we're able to hit it all the way in backside a you know for a, another solid run on second and long same play as earlier 21p window dress it with motion and now this time it's bad camera work but the tag wins on the front side because the four eye spikes the tight end just has a, a loose nine does just enough and we're able to get one-on-one -on, -one on the secondary player so um, you know, we, we think it gives us opportunity to do some really good things. The other thing that we like about it is we keep the exact same rules for our mid zone when we get into our, um, all of our split zone stuff. So whether it's same side split zone, like this clip is the only difference is really for us is what our tailback reads. If we were running true mid zone to the left here, he is aiming for this, um, this, this imaginary spot out here for that tight end. And if anything shows color, he's going to get his eyes to this front side backer and cut off of him um, or, or cut to daylight is honestly what he'll tell you happens the most. Um, but when we run our split zone, his path looks the same, but he's actually going to put his eyes on the backside inside linebacker. If he fits front side on flow, it gives us a natural cutback. And if he fits and backdoors it for some type of a scrape exchange, we're usually able to at that point get into the front side eight. So from the offensive line standpoint, not a thing has changed. We've changed the tight end's job. We've changed the read of the tailback, but you can see him here, you know, shoulders are turned slightly square to the line of scrimmage. We window dress it with motion to affect the safety. Um, but it gives us a chance now. The backer tries to scrape over the top, so we backdoor it right now and, and, and get vertical. Same thing here. Pete, Same. quick question for you, man. Yes, sir. Um, do you all change your back's alignment uh, when you all have an inside card? Do you change the alignment based on whether you're running inside zone or mid zone we, or wide zone? You no, know, Coach. We, we have the, when I was a defense coordinator, I spent five years, and the two first things we looked at as soon as we got formation broken down was depth and width of the tailback and alignment and the quarterback's feet. You know, and so when I came over to offense, one of my things is I'm going to be as consistent as I can possibly be with the alignment of my backfield. So we, we tell our tailback, and he had a tendency to get a little wider than I wanted. But last year, we put him with his outside foot splitting the tackle's butt crack, um, and we put his toes on the quarterback's heels. And it didn't matter if we were running power, counter, um, mid zone. Uh, toss it didn't matter his alignment it didn't change the other thing that helped in our mind it helped pass protection when he's picking up off the edge and it helped us getting him out in our five-man protection stuff and getting him into the flat in a hurry so like the look you see from the tailback here coach it's consistent for us now we will get in the pistol some we'll tag pistol uh, and we will start in the pistol and then move late to try to hide tendency against certain teams um, but as far as initial alignment or where we want them when the ball snapped, we're pretty consistent. I was just going to really say, Coach Deweese, uh, the way you run your buck sweep is probably why you get so much overflow well, the, because the look is the, almost identical. Well, the truth control. is, Coach, we, we, we have not really been able to run the buck much in the past two years. Um, our, 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 in 2019, um, uh, our tight end was not comfortable in that role so we had other things we could ask him to do in 2018 our guards weren't good at it so we didn't do it in 2017 and i know that's um one of the things that you've seen on, on online 
Um, it, but in, in 2017, they, uh, our kids understood it. That was that and inside zone. That, that was what we did period. Um, and, and so it, it would have made sense then. Now it just, we're going to hit you outside enough that we have to get some fast flow from the backers or you have to be really good at setting it up. The best teams we played, Harrison won a state title this year. Alatuna, who Harrison beat for the state title this year. Um, Lanier with Philip Webb, who signed with LSU. Those, they had kids that could set the edge, and their inside backers didn't have to be in a hurry. Everybody else we played, we felt like we got fast flow out of backers that opened up cutbacks for us in almost every game. Um. You know, but, but you know, just kind of going back, I mean, you can see here on our, our split zone, it's the same side. But, again, his eyes are right there on that, that – on this linebacker. As soon as he sees him insert into this A-gap, he's looking to backdoor it right now. The motion to help us create it, a, a nice big play. Um, so, now, you know, here's a couple clips. Um, you know, one of the things, again, we liked about our rules is we can get some funky stuff and everything holds up for us. So we're in a, a tight bunch here, but we're going to go split flow, bring him across. We're going to bring a guy around in like a, a reverse or pitch man motion, but we should be solo here. These two are going to combo to him. He's solo. He's going to cut that in, or he's going to work up to the backer. There's an end you can't see right there that we're looking for um, mm. as we, we come across. But our – what we tell him in the um, against the stack front, instead of reading backside, is we read the mic. So he's going to fit off of that mic now, um, because we feel like we can control this guy, whether it's with the tackle and us splitting to the end or locking on the end and inserting for the backer. The mic is the hardest guy to get to sometimes in the stack. So that's where our tailback's eyes are going to be here. He sees him fit right there, and you know just stays downhill. Um, same, same play, same, same team, different front. Now, again, you know, the mic fits front side, gets pushed all the way to front side B and he's able to hurdle a guy that got his ass whipped. Um, same thing here, coming back across Mike's fast over the top. He takes the cut back, um, you know, gives us a chance to be successful. We will also do the same thing. Um, and insert our sniffer. And our sniffer wasn't great at it last year, but here we start in a 10P. We move him to the inside. And so what we'll do now is we'll keep our same zone rules. So if this, if our tackle feels like he's a threat in the run game, we'll spot it out. So we'll be there. So we'll now work our combo to him. He's going to lock on him. We'll ISO this guy, run on the safety. He's going to read it just like he would our regular mid zone when we do this. So he's looking to get front side, and as soon as he gets color, he's going to stick his foot in the ground and work off the, the block of the sniffer. Hey, Coach, what defensive alignment do you think gives you the most trouble? Bear. Yep. Because, we, you know, if I could spend an entire game in 12 or 21P, I would. Um, that's We don't have those bodies, and we, we haven't had those bodies. Um, it, but that gives me a chance to account for Bear. And, you know, I, I can run power against it. I can run zone against it. And I can get hat for hat. Um, but when I'm basing out of 11P, if you're not a good power team, um, and even with power, you have trouble sometimes getting to the backside backer um, if there's two backers in the box. Um, but if you're not, if you're an 11P team or a 10P team and you can get away being sound on the back end and playing Bear, Coaches, offensive coaches, do you guys agree? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Bear always gave, gave us fits last year. I mean, we saw a bunch of it. And it we would have to do a bunch of different, different – I've, I've always liked running against a bear. <clears throat> you have? I think – you know, do, I think, do, do I think zone's your best answer sometimes against bear? No. Right. But uh, I do think for sure there's a lot of – Gap scheme, pin and pull stuff that For you sure. play, things like that where you can manipulate them. I think a lot of times, especially on the goal line, you know, you'll see a lot of Notre Dame clips doing it, uh, and a lot of NFL teams doing it. Is these defensive coordinators think that when they go bare, it's their answer to all things. Yeah. But, but reality is, 
you got to treat Bayer similar to how you treat Eagle defense. Agreed. All right. And at the end of the day, if you can get in 12 personnel, you don't even have to have great tight ends or a fullback to do it. You can kill them with the G play. And a lot of times you just force that defensive end to make a decision. If he wants to line up in a seven. Yep. Great. You wash him down. Yep. If you if he wants to line up in a nine, jab him with both tight ends and have the tight ends go to the respective numbers. Yep. And then you just kick him out. Yep. Uh, now, I do think zone against Bear can be tough. I don't think mid zone is necessarily great against Bear. Um, I do think more of a tight zone where you're aiming more towards the backside A gap with your running back path is good. Uh, but I do think there's ways to get a defense out of Bear on the goal line. Uh, agreed. Uh, I, I, I've, I've always been a fan. I, I like power. Um, you know, if, if you feel like you can account for it. I'm with you. I love the G play, old school down, wing tee football. Um, when we were in 2017, my first year at Sprayberry, and we were running a lot of buck sweep to get us out of it, teams would get into bear, and they would either shade the nose, you know, or slant the nose to the tight end, or they would run a backer through a gap when the center was occupied. And, and one of the answers for us was it's either stretch or – um, or, or G, um, and, and G is not something we probably ever put enough time into. Um, but that is a great answer. I agree. If, if teams are, are giving you bear, it's, especially if they're an odd front that's, that's moving those ends inside. Cause those Vipers in, in almost every three, four iteration that I've ever studied, those Vipers are going to be taught. You go through the V of the neck of the down tight end and split the tight end in the wing. Um, and, and if you can either wash him or kick him, you really give yourself a chance to, uh, to, to hit it and be successful. Um, coaches, I will say this. If you are interested in, uh, in how we run our mid zone and you would like some more information on that, hit me up on Twitter or DM me um, or, or send me an email um, or, or check, check out the website and, and send, me, uh, send me an email on there. Um, I will gladly share information with you as far as our blocking rules, how we communicate it. Um, I, I, and, and if you got something to share, I'll take it back. I want to flip the script real quick, and um, I want to talk outside zone. I know, um, I know Coach Queso is an outside zone fan. I know Coach Feaster's on here um, and does a great job. I think Coach Timmerman logged on earlier um, is another big time outside zone proponent. Um, so I would love to talk mid zone, and I'll be honest with you. I would love – or not mid zone, outside zone. And I would really love to talk about it um, from both a 10P and an 11P structure, um, but specifically against the against an odd front and, and, and how you guys teach it and kind of what you do. So if any of you guys would like to step in and talk or if you would like to share your screen, if you've got your computer available, um, I, can, I can make that happen. Uh, I'll go ahead real quick, Coach. I think a lot of it goes back to, like you said earlier, you're expecting high school defensive players to fit it correctly. Yes. And you run wide zone, what you guys call outside zone, I call it stretch. Um, really, you know, it gives your back an opportunity to be correct because if you're going to run this thing 20 times a night, that defense is not going to be right every time. And yes. if you guys understand angles and they just run – and I tell them either reach or widen. Those are your two options. You either reach the dude that you're reaching or you widen him, and the back will make us right. That linebacker is going to get caught running over the top. At some point, we'll cut back behind him. At some point, he'll try to undercut it back door. We'll stay outside of him. And, and at some point, there's going to be a numbers disadvantage, but those high school players don't always fit it right. And at some point, you just have to run your best play. So uh... – Coach Fisher, I, I can actually show some film of your guys running it. Um, you know, a couple years ago when they y'all had a great season at Creekview, um, and, and you guys were doing a, a really nice job. You know, freaking first play of the game, y'all opened up and, and and caught us off guard. Um, caught our defense off guard with a, a big time shift. But you know, you guys, you can see my screen. This is this is Coach Fisher's offensive line at Creekview a couple years ago, and you had some special players on that offense. Yeah, I was a lot better coach that year than I oh, had before. Hey, we all are, brother. We <laughs> all know how that, that happens. Yeah. But what, left tackle went to Clemson, right tackle to Mississippi State, tailback at Kennesaw State, and a, a few others, right? Right ends at Army. Yeah. So, some, some some dudes that could really play. But, so, Coach, if you can see the screen, talk to me yeah. here 
about, you know, what, what's your coaching point for these kids right here? Because they are turning and running. And what I love, Coach, and what I, what I believe when you watch a good outside zone team is you can freeze frame that thing, and those offensive linemen are damn near going to be step for step. And I always, all season long, when we would watch your kids on film, that's always what I saw. I mean, you can see right there, there's one guy that's basically not a mirror image of the other dudes in the screen. Yeah, um, and that's that's the kid that's playing at LaGrange. Great kid, but not quite the same as the others. But yep. he caught on very quickly. Um, but, yeah, the, the key is – and, again, I find that balance. When you described your mid zone, that's the – that's the, the every year is a conundrum for me of do I want him to truly run like you see in this clip or do I want more vertical movement? And the more I've just repped it, this is kind of what it turns out to be. Right. And because our coaching point is I want you to, to try to reach the defender in your play side gap. And if you can't reach them, you better widen them. And so right now, when once to go unbalanced and, and you guys kind of – you adjusted, but you're still going to be short because of the tight end out there, it's just we get that backside cutoff. So that, that backside guard over here. Yes, sir. Uh, I really – his goal is to cut off that backside, the shade. Yep. And from there, that's our – that's like the edge of where the ball is going to go. It won't go back beyond that. But every gap from their play side is open for our, for our running back to make that cut. So I, I, I love the kid I've got highlighted here. I love what he does on this play because I know the kid we've got lined up across from him is a, a really good football player. Kid's going to be a senior for us next year. And I know our kid can get off the football. And I, I watch the angle your kid takes because our kid realizes late what's happened. He He's not a 4.0 student. Let's just put it at that. So he realizes late. He widens out. The backer's probably telling him something. And the angle your kid takes, so his first step here, he doesn't gain ground, but it, I don't. It's not a deep bucket step. It's almost like a pivot step. Yeah, I, this this goes back to my my background in the in the full T is I have this this just inability to teach kids to go backwards, and so I will never tell a kid to lose ground. But their aim point of the first step should get their play side foot outside of their play side defender. The first, so his, so his first step his first aim here. Yes, outside of his minimal of his star. Side That's side center. Center. Oh, okay. And perfect world. The Today second was day the nine crop. of cooking our own meals, so. so hey, there coaches, if somebody back. can hit mute, we're getting some background noise. Cooking our own meals, what does that mean? Um, she hasn't eaten out. She hasn't so, brought home so This time, home. we're able to widen him. He, he really has cooking, to not her. And he eventually gets his head there. And oh, there's grub. Him, but. No, she's trying you know, to. He, he didn't have to. Run. He could have no just hammered him outside. The back would have cut in. Staying inside. home. Have you, Get that? Have like you told her to reach? No, I haven't. Say, so ask that again, coach. The, the goal is for him to reach. Yeah. yeah. He just, and he just kept fighting until he yeah. didn't do that. So I, anybody that studies outside zone knows you got to be great with the backside hand. So your your kids right here. I mean, he rips that backside hand through, and kind of helps build that wall to now get him. You just held up and get him vertical to seal him now for the tailback. What? How do you drill that? Is that? Is that? I mean, obviously part of your everyday stuff in Indy. Yeah, we. I mean, we would do uh, one on ones, two on twos. We did tons of combo work, um, and and the biggest thing is for them just to to understand. First step, you know, is to get outside leverage. Second step in the crotch, and that backside hand is that second step's coming up through the crotch. That hand's got to strike. <laughs> excuse me, strike the midline of that defender. And at that point, it's a race, and you just got to run your ass. And if you can stay outside leverage and reach them, then good. And then the back's got to be smart enough to see that and make the cut. So it's just an everyday drill. Reach, reach, reach. Yeah, we just we, – again, being at a smaller school, well, you know, 3A, about 500 kids, um, you know, O-line, D-line coach kind of does it both. We just kind of call that our rip and run. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We kind of have a rip and run drill. Same kind of thing, step over. In, in the summer, we'd rep it with our D linemen. So we would go like two on one, and the D lineman wouldn't know which way we're going to reach. And they, that way, the D line could work on reacting to zone either way. Right, uh, right. You're getting cut off on the backside or getting reached to the front side. But a lot of our kids get really good work in the summer, and the D line as well is just pure technique. So, same, same kind of thing for us, coach. Yep. yep. Yeah, and, and honestly, we, we felt the same way about our mid zone, is, and we did the same kind of stuff. Um, let, let me ask you this, Coach. So, you know, I know 
that season, that season in particular. I know when you were at Kennesaw Mountain, we coached against you um, and, and, and saw what you did there. Our kids and, did not look like these kids in white, by the way, at Kennesaw I, Mountain. Uh, they didn't. But, that hey, that, that that group you had at, at Creekview, that, that was a, a big, good-looking group of kids. Those are tough, hard-nosed kids. But let me ask you this. I know that year, what we see on the screen, you ran your outside zone, you ran power, you ran counter, and that was that was – that was the bulk of your run game. Was, am I missing much else yeah, that, that y'all really – We did have inside zone. But, right. Um, I would say that the, the three you mentioned probably count for at least – for probably 90% of our run game. So, if uh, that's 90% of your run game, what percentage of your practice time goes to your outside zone? Because that's one of the things I've always felt is when you watch outside zone team, you have to major in it. You can't minor in it. It can't be something you dabble in. It has to be what you do. Do you feel like that? Absolutely. I've had some talks with guys this offseason about stretch and, and I've told them I almost, it became for me like an option mentality. So I came from the the T and then we ran some option stuff and then we transitioned to the spread and, and really became outside zone became like our, our veer play. That was our play. We're going to run out of every personnel and every formation every week. It's not going to be something that we say, Hey, this week we're seeing this front. We can't run it. Bull crap. That's our play. We're going to run it. And so, I think it's a lot like a lot like if you're a Veer team that you've got to be committed to practice an outside zone or stretch every single day, um, and I try to mirror, you know, make my practice reps. You know, if, if that year at Creekview we were about 65 to 68 percent run over the course of the season, so two thirds of my practice time is run game, and probably 75 percent of that time is stretch, um, and it just it's one of those things that we had to rep. It's it is expensive, but again, I I feel like if you commit to, to outside zone or stretch, whatever you want to call it, the series you can build off of that, it can be a huge percentage of what you do offensively in terms of RPO, play action. Somebody mentioned midline read a, a little bit ago. We, would, we ran that this year at South Evanham, some midline read off of a sidecar stretch. And so you can add enough components to it. It can be what you do. So let, let me ask this. I know we've got a, we've got a couple defensive guys on here, I, I know. And uh, Howie, I don't know if you're still on, but I, I, I coordinated defenses. Um, and, and like I said, we've got a couple on here. I know that the best outside zone teams when I was a defense coordinator that I faced, um, you know, Bob Spire when Bob was at North Gwinnett, um, they did a great job. And they had freaking kids that could line up in the slot or line up at tight end, and it didn't matter. And they were damn good at what they did. Um, and, 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 you know, Colquitt County, I know – um, you know, Nick, you know, I know obviously Joey and that bunch he had at Colquitt in 2014. Um, they were really damn good up front and, and played some other good ones. I, outside zone does so much. It can do so much to distort your fits and make it hard on you. You know, you, you, you can slant yourself into a bad play in a hurry. Um, and it, it, it's, it's especially if you do a good job of formation, like the, the clip here where you're in split back and you actually bring a guy in jet motion. Um, and, and end up giving it to him, you know, if you can protect your tendencies with outside zone, with stretch, um, it, it can do so much to distort a defense. Do you, do you other defensive guys agree with me on, on that? you got to have plays that protect your plays. Yes. You know, I mean, it's – like I said, you know, talking, talking earlier about, you know, the way you were running your midline, Pete, you know, going back to some older film that I saw, like I said, when you watch it, they look eerily similar to the buck sweep. So when you're trying to talk to high school kids about that and you're trying to tell them, hey, do your job, not just go out there and try and make a play, you know, it's damn tough to tell a 16-year-old kid to do your job and then do it. But when you can get them to do it, those are normally your best teams anyway, right? Uh, for sure. For the sure. biggest thing I think, Coach, for defensive perspective is that gap, that, that, that linebacker, say that Mike Backer in a stack, he might be assigned to the A gap. But as soon as that ball is snapped, that A gap's moving in a hurry. In a hurry. A gap is going to be displaced sometimes when you see those clips where we get wide alignments and we just straight up run. That A gap might move five to seven yards by the time the back hits the line of scrimmage. And so you're asking that guy to cover an awful lot of ground, and it goes back to the whole thing. That kid will not fit it right all night long. Now, 
Coach, nowadays being at, um, you know, new school, obviously different offense. I, I know you, I'm sure you guys are still running. And I know, I believe Coach Timmerman, I think you're on. I know you guys at Grayson. How much true stretch do you run where you're going to lock the backside tackle and RPO something on the backside? Or is it more of a front side RPO? And how do you keep the quarterback clean in doing it? Because um, that's one of the things that I always look at as I'm watching film. Like, if we're looking at this clip, and I'm going to give it to number five, which would have been a very good decision for anybody calling an offense with him in it. Um, but if I'm going to give him outside zone and I'm going to lock him, you're obviously giving up an opportunity for run through um, if the ball does cut back. So h how much RPO are you doing off the, the outside zone? Because um, I've always felt safe doing it off of our mid zone concept. Um, and, and, and even – even but with outside zone, I do feel like you speed up the read for the quarterback and really allow him to make a fast decision because this back – this he has to be a fast flow player to be anything effective in the run game. Yeah, I, my answer to that would be I, I tend to prefer play action as my answer. Um, you know, the, the argument for the RPO game is that you give your opportunity for the quarterback to be right. But if he can be right, he can be wrong. And sure. so I, I tend to, to want to be able to dictate it a little bit more. And so when I was at Kennesaw Mountain, uh, play action was most of our, you know, our complement. We did get that last year into some sidecar, into some RPO stuff because the quarterback had developed. And we had a really good tight end. We had some things we could do. But um, I think from a safety standpoint, just, I, I like the play action game because, again, that's a whole other series with different looks. Your split foe zone sets it up. And – and you see it in the NFL, they can't hardly cover a boot with a fullback in the flat. And so I think it opens things up for you. And it's, it, to me, it makes it a little bit safer. Now, um, at Creekview, you know, we weren't really there long enough to develop a, a really good complement to stretch. Right. Uh, it was basically – we ran a few RPOs, but it was mainly just a backside quarterback read and then the play-action game. And so, uh, I mean, I have some experience with RPOs off inside zone. They've done a little bit off stretch, but the play-action was mainly my answer. Any of you other guys that are outside zone guys, do you do you prefer doing your RPOs off of gap schemes or inside or middle zone as opposed to outside zone? Anybody have anything to add to that? Uh, I, I think I think that's almost like a loaded question because it, it kind of depends. You know, I think no matter what my philosophy is, whatever works. Well, whatever works, but I think I think there's a lot of teams out there because the Big 12 takes this approach of not blocking the backside defensive end. Yep. And I just don't believe in that at all. I agree. Uh, you know, I'm, not to throw any shade, but Big 12 teams don't win national championships. Uh, you know, I, I think it's whatever in your system. You know, I think if you're trying to throw somewhere – where the linebacker is going to move, and if they chase pullers, then do a gap scheme. Yep. Uh, I think if it's a system where if you want to run outside zone, right, and you know they're a fast flow team, and as long as, you know, if you're running it to a three-by-one set, and you're running it to the three side, and you want to hit a slant backside, I think there's multiple ways you can work it. I think the teams that, best, the teams that are best at the RPOs stick with the system that works. Yes. You know, uh, I think most importantly, you don't want to mess with the quarterback's eyes. And quite frankly, there's some quarterbacks who shit down their leg when they see a pulling ball. You know, uh, so always make sure, in my opinion, what the quarterback feels comfortable with. But I say both. Now, I'm more gap scheme oriented. Uh, I think zone's really good if you got some dogs up front uh, who can move people. Uh, in a more effective manner, but you know, I think you know one of our best RPOs we do is off of uh, counter. You know, uh, that's us personally. Uh, you know, we do a lot of RPOs off tight zone. Uh, not as much outside zone, just because it's just a little bit tougher. Because uh, a lot of times with outside zone. Uh, a backside D lineman, it's easier to trickle through yeah, and hit the quarterback. Uh, and there's just more moving parts up front, depending on how you run it. Uh, but I say, you know, your RPO game should be based off your run game. If you aren't a gap scheme team, don't run gap scheme RPOs up front. For sure. 
it, I also think that, you know, my, my prerogative as far as running stretch is to do it out of pistol. I much prefer pistol. I think if I want the ball to hit, you know, C gap to D gap consistently, it's easier to do that from pistol. It's an easier read for the back. And then to me, it sets up that play action game that I want anyway, because you get more effect of play action fake off pistol than you do off sidecar. So now are you doing pistol out of 10 personnel or 11 personnel? I, coach, we would do it out of – I would run it out of 10 personnel, anything, 12 person. it didn't matter. I would run pistol. We, you know, I've, I, I have to find it. I have a clip from playing Sprayberry in 17 where we ran stretch to the trips out of 10 personnel. And, yeah, we've it, it, you know, numbers-wise it wasn't a great, you know, call. Let's not uh, talk about that season. But it, but it, it asked it, one of their, you know, alley defenders who's not used to playing a run at his face to come and fit it. And, and so I'll run pistol out of any personnel. I don't care. Uh, I'll, I'm with you. My only thing is, so that is just my opinion. If you're going to be a ten personnel team, and if you're going to have ten personnel runs, you have to do a lot of option based principles. Mm-hmm. I feel the uh, same way because that's how you get the numbers. Now we do it both ways. So if we're out of ten or eleven, you know we have different calls. But if we run it out of pistol and we want to hit it out of front side entry, that's a certain call. But we also run pistol outside zone where he's going down the pipe in the backside A, and he's just taking a left or right turn. Uh, And he's keeping the read all the same. Uh, I personally get a little bit weary doing 10 personnel uh, if you're not going to read the backside defensive ends or if you're not going to run in midline or something like that. Just because 10 personnel gives you so many options if you can read somebody because then that gives you an additional number. You know, that, that's, that's you know, obviously one of the things with high school football that so many of you guys can relate to is, you know, year one I take over installing a new offense that was drastically different from, from what they had done in the past. And, and um, but I had a kid that, that, that understood. It didn't matter what I threw at him, didn't matter what, what the team threw at him on Friday night as far as a quarterback, the kid understood how to handle it. He understood – what he, what he should do, what the response should be. Didn't mean the guys around him did necessarily, but he's a bright kid. He's a scout team player of the year as a walk-on quarterback at Samford this past year. And um, but, but he understood the game. He was a very cerebral kid. Fast forward the next year, he's gone, and I get a kid that, that the RPO game wasn't where he was going to be successful. He's playing safety at Army now. He, was, he needed to be reading an end or have a designed run for him more so than he needed – um, RPO. So with him, everything RPO wise was it was a perimeter screen. Where now, fast forward, a kid that I had this past year who will be back, um, not as dynamic as a runner. And quite honestly, he's a good runner, but I can't afford to lose him because my backups are not close to ready. And that's a number one for me this off season if we ever have one. Um, but um, but he's a better second level read guy except he's five foot ten and our, our offensive linemen are not five foot ten so you know it's it, it's a tricky game with rpos and i think that's where a lot of coaches get themselves in trouble is is they see something on saturday or on a friday night and, and they want to take that square peg they want to force it into the round hole and it looks great on paper but it's like throwing shallow I mean, right? I mean, everybody, it seems like, has some version of shallow in their offense. Well, my kid can't see the shallow. And it would be open so many damn times during the season. And he didn't throw it because he couldn't see it. And the few times that it, he had enough time to let it clear the tackle box and he got it out there, we had some real nice gains off of it. That wasn't happening a lot. So that can't be a big part of what I do moving forward. And I feel the same way about the run game and about RPOs in particular. So I, I understand your point uh, for, for sure, Coach. I think that the other side of that is, if it goes back to personnel, like you said, Coach Dewey's, you know, it's what you have. And you haven't had the tight ends per se. You know, I've been very fortunate. 17, we had a kid that's at Georgia, another kid that's shorter. Yep. Uh, 18 at Creepy, we had the kid that's at Army. And, uh, Paxton Naaman. That's him, baby. I uh, remember recruiting him. And another one that ended up at uh, – is going to end up going to Savannah State, my son. We had two big tight ends who could block. And so, for three years, I've had two tight ends that I felt like we could get in 12 personnel, we could get in 11 personnel, we could bring them off the ball. So, I didn't do a lot of 10 personnel because I had the bodies and I could leave a, a pass down the field. He could go and play the slot and, and catch a corner route and, and catch a hitch. And so, I've been very fortunate. And the, the goatee kid at Kennesaw Mountain, same, I had tight ends that could do that. And so – 
you know, I could say I'm in 10 personnel, but the, the one of those receivers is a, is a six, four to six, six tight end body. So I've been very fortunate with that position. So that's yeah, my, my, mine did not look like that last year. Let's just say that great kid, love him to death. I mean, you know, we, we, we go to Lanier in the first round of the playoffs and, and Lanier's in Gwinnett County, and they, they do a really good job. And they had the Philip Webb kid, an outside linebacker, and they're 3-4, and he's going to LSU um, over his final three were LSU, Bama, and Clemson. So he had a couple decent opportunities. Um, but I, that was our – I mean, shit, he was going to whip our kid's ass, but our kid was going to go down fighting. Um, so we ran at him because running away from him wasn't an option because the dude was already bigger than everybody, and he was also faster than everybody. So let's just go right at him. Um, that's the other question I guess I have about outside zone is if a team has a the, – the two things I've always found that give me the most trouble trying to run outside zone is a team with a great edge player. And, you know, people just say, we'll run against him or run away from him. We'll, sure, we can do that to a certain degree. But really it's also when teams have a great – whether he's a four-eye or a, a head-up or, or, or a front-side shade, that front-side interior guy and that front-side force player – um, that's what's always given me the most issue as an outside zone guy. Um, and I'd love to hear some feedback on maybe some different things you guys try to do. Is it adding the tight end? Is it, you know, what is it you do? Or do you just trust your scheme and let him be wrong? I say what we do is, all right, so say you're running outside zone in this case that like we talked about, and that defensive end is a great player. He's going to box everything in. He's not going to get reached, right? In my opinion, what you do is let him do what he wants to do then. Have, have your running back read the defensive end. That's what we do. We have, we have our running back read the end band on the line scrimmage. Right. You pay 17 off him. So if he's going to box everything in, that's fine. But then at that point, tell your tackle, hey, work the steps we teach you. Try to get your aiming point. Try to reach him once you can. Use his momentum and his speed and torque his body weight outside. That way to continue your stretch. You know, I think with the tight end, anytime you have a tight end, you know, we run outside zone four or five different ways with the tight end. You know, right. we have outside zone force where he'll go up to the safety and block the alley player. Or we have, you know, what we call a boss call. We'll work everything back inside. Uh, but those are more game plan deals. But for me, that's why you have the running back read the end man on the line of scrimmage. You know, it's same thing with the four eye. If they're in, you know, what we call a mint front where it's a nose, two, four eyes, yep. and then a stand-up backer to the boundary, uh, I think it's very hard to run to the boundary with it, just depending on the guys you have. But if you want to run it back to the field, as long as you can have the perimeter blocked up, then it becomes a super easy block. Yep. Because then at that point, the four eyes already reached. So there, you know it's going to be an around the horn play. Uh, as we like to say, have that play side guard open up a little bit to overtake the four eye, have the tackle, make sure he pops the shoulder open because you're going to be able to tell on film is the four eye, is he a tackle reader or is he a guard reader? And if he's a tackle reader and a four eye, you know, he's going to run with the tackle. Yep. Right. And those are little things you can change with his footwork as a play side to do it. But you have to have that guard overtake the four eye and the tackle get up to the backer on the combo that they're working. And the running back has to realize from pre-snap alignment, the ball's probably going to hit to the outside, right? Still have them read that four eye to be safe and to make you correct. That way we're not guessing. And get around the horn, get the perimeter blocked up because you can always protect yourself with the formation. Right. Uh, now me personally going to outside zone, you know, hearing some of the other thoughts, Man, unless you got Quentin Nelson when he was at Notre Dame, I think it's very hard to run outside zone to a three technique. It, now, it, it can be very difficult. Now, seeing how Creekview ran it, that's more, you know, because I remember that team because, you know, when I was at West Georgia, we were recruiting Paxton then, you know, he went to go to Army. Uh, so I was at several Creekview games. But to me, that's more of a stretch like thought process. And to me, we don't run stretch. So our outside zone, what you is what you call mid zone almost. Right now, we'll block it up entirely a little different. But the thing I don't like about stretch is it doesn't always give the running back a definitive read. 
And I don't like it because nine times out of ten on your football team, the running back's the dumbest player. And that's just how it is. You want to make sure the running back has a one-step read or a one-person read and he can go. I'll say this. He's not always the dumbest, but on years where he's been the smartest, we haven't been very good. Exactly. Um, Coach Smith, you look like you had something to add a second ago. Because I know we were, talk, we were talking about um, – the, the playing against good DNs, and uh, I've had the opportunity to coach on teams with good DNs. We yes, had you did. When I was at Langston and uh, this and at Douglas County, uh, one of our DNs just committed to Georgia today. And we had one. We got one in Arkansas. So I've I've had to coach against or with, but against and practice with good DNs. And I know we're talking about um, not being able to reach them. Um, what we do a lot is that's what that's where our bash concepts come into play. I know we talk, you know, guys don't really want to run your quarterbacks too much, but we'll we'll attach bash to everything. Yep. If, we're, if we're running if we're running book, we'll attach bash to it. If we're running uh power, maybe more be more of a power read look, but uh if we're running if we're running wide zone or stretch, we'll run it away from him and just read him. If he's not gonna let us reach him, give him some action to chase and then have the the all the other run action going the other way. That's kind of a way that we kind of uh, we kind of combat against playing those DNs that we have uh, that, that we know we can't reach them. So we're not going to bump our head on on trying to figure out how to reach them. We'll use his technique against. Them. So, that's so, so that, just that to make can. sure everybody's on the same page, bash. We're talking, and I know Coach Queso, you were Coach Freeze, and it's something he's always done. But we're showing stretch this direction. We're blocking our run play the opposite direction. So whether it's outside zone, buck, inside zone, and now you're asking this defensive end, you're making him a front side read player. And if he wants to be flat down the line, you got a chance to give it and get on the perimeter. But if he's upfield now, your quarterback essentially replaces your tailback, and you're you're just inverting the read of what what would naturally be an inside yeah, zone that's, or outside zone scheme. That, that that's, that's, that's what we call how we get on the edge. Against against the ends that we can't block. Yep, that's and that that's. I'm glad you said that because that's I'd written down in my notes. That was the next question that I was really going to ask was was does anybody run bash and maybe use that to counter a, a really good player on the edge? Because that it, it, again, if you're willing to run your quarterback, if you've got one that's a good athlete and and is durable, it, it's a great it's a great scheme that you can marry with almost anything in the right game. Um, and, and certainly be very effective. Well, yeah, we see a lot of it here, Coach, and and that's one of our. It was probably our our best play um, this past year. Um, I see a lot more teams running it against us. You know, again, it's really veer principles. So at yep. the same, you know, at the same time. So, um, <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> pardon me, especially when you start getting in the two back set stuff. And you come with, you know, uh, a, a flash across the front like you're running, you know, like you're running fast, and then come back with the speed option in the opposite direction. Yeah, it can be it can be a little bit tough. Yeah, I'm sure. Anybody else got anything? You know, I think, uh, you know, and, and obviously it's it's a little bit different. But so with that play is you know it's a sucker principle and that's a game plan play so we'll either counter off it or zone off it. Um, you know, to me, what I've realized is just because a player, you know, for instance, we went and played BYU this year. Uh, it, you know, they're a bunch of twenty-seven-year-old pissed-off Mormons who just got back from the mission. Uh, but they had a nose tackle. You know, our at Liberty, we were playing with FCS kids. And their nose tackle was really big, right? He was 6'1". He'll be a top two-round draft pick in a year. Uh, to me, you can never go at the thought process of that's their best player. Let's not run at him. At the end of the day, the BYU nose tackle knew he was better than any old lineman we had, right? So we had to play to what he wanted to do. He was going to be super aggressive. Therefore, we were going to double-team him from different sides. Yep. Uh, we were going to wham him. We were going to do things. We were going to run outside zone to get him moving a little bit. Uh, and I think, you know, especially with the sucker play, with that, that's really a play that you maybe call once or twice a game, if that. 
Uh, and how you want to run the quarterback, that depends. But the biggest thing with the sucker play, or what, what you guys were calling bash, where you make the defensive end trigger, yep. uh, is you have to have the perimeter block. You do. No question. And, and, and you have to have the correct angles with the perimeter blocking. Because on paper, in the box, in a play like that, the box doesn't really matter because the play's going to hit to the outside. Because you're not really running the bash play to run with the quarterback, in my opinion. Yep. You're running it to get to the perimeter. And, you know, to me, there's other ways to make that defensive end do what he wants to do. Like, you know, for instance, a lot of teams, what they were doing against Chase Young, especially Wisconsin, right? They knew that if they ran directly at Chase Young, they weren't going to get any movement. So what did they do? They tailored all their counter plays and zone plays to make sure that they hit right inside of them. Right. And I think if you have this powerful defensive end, especially, you know, you trust me, guys, I recruited Georgia. The, in my opinion, best football. There's going to be a defensive end almost every single week who's going to play FBS football. That defensive end, nine times out of ten, because they're getting lankier and they're getting faster, just like at the college level, you're going to have to let him play outside. Right? And there's ways you can get to the perimeter. I think counter's a great option. I still think outside zone's a great option for that. Uh, and that's more of where the G play comes in, because I think the G play and outside zone go hand in hand. Right. Because it's the same running back path. Yep. Uh, and, you know, to me, you know, uh, we always like to carry eight or nine different run schemes into a game. And, but we always try to make it easy for the offensive line with how we call it. Uh, but with outside zone with it, I just think if you can formation it to where you can get an open B-gap run, then I would run it to their best defensive end every single time. And, I, and we would have the running back read that defensive end, and he would make a play. Because the way they're going to teach the linebacker structure is that D coordinator is going to think, that's my best defensive end. I'm not going to have to give him that much help. Therefore, your angles working up to the second level are going to be easier. Yep. Um, uh, and, well, I, I know in 2012 and 2013, um, we, we were decent on defense, and I was I was coordinating. And, you know, we had Carl Lawson, and 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 you know Carl played at Auburn, had a good career, and he's with the Bengals now. And and it was funny because most teams their 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 answer was run away from him, um, which always helped me because. It didn't matter if you were going to gap hinge or try to read him. He was probably going to make the play. Um, we had very few teams that really made a concerted effort to go at him all night. And John Ford and his Roswell team, um, they, they did. And they had a really good tailback. The offensive line was nothing special. But at everything they did from, from they understood Carl was going to squeeze power and he was going to try to spill it. He was going to squeeze counter and try to spill it. Um, so everything they did from their zone game to running more inside trap instead of true power and expecting to log counter all night long, um, it, 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 I'm not going to say it took him out of the game because he still had a productive game. He was a special player. Um, but it, it did limit his opportunity in a lot of ways. Um, so I, I, I definitely understand that point. I mean, Lord knows, I know, Coach White, you were talking a minute ago about the kids you had at Langston Hughes. Um, it, when we played in the playoffs in 2014, that was one of the best high school defensive lines I've ever seen. And I know you guys had to go up against them every day in practice. Um, those kids could flat out do it, man. So I, well, I, I, I agree with you. Attacking that kid a lot of times and using his, their scheme and his skill set against him, if you can do it, is probably a great answer. But, you know, with the play side tackle, if we can go to footwork real quick, with outside zone, we're going to tell the play side tackle is your aim point is going to be the play side armpit. Yep. All right, you have to get your helmet there. And at the end of the day, what these defensive ends are taught is don't get, don't get reached, don't get reached, don't get reached. If you fight like hell to get your helmet across, and as long as you don't close down the inside lane with your hips, that defensive end is naturally going to let the play stretch. All right, so Coach, I, I just I got one question for you. So let's say right now, what I have drawn up, it's obviously it's a very static front, right? We're we're going to put the tight end, you know, he's he's going to work play side armpit here. 
what angle are you going to teach this right tackle right now if he's got a guy that's head up to a slight outside? Is, is he taking this flat, wide step, or are you telling him right now because he's a tight defender to take that outside arm pit? I'm still telling him to take that outside arm pit. Okay. And to, to me, the reason why our outside zone, mid zone, and tight zone look effective is when the linebacker's looking in the backfield, it all looks the same. Right. But who the running back reading is what makes the play. So, at the end of the day, in this right here, so that's Sam linebacker. He's going to have everything outside the tackle. So, we'll just call that. He'll have the total D gap. With how this defensive end is playing, he is, he is now declaring that he is going to be the B gap player in a way. This play side guard is going to have to mirror the tackle steps to take it over. The play side guard and the play side tackle are going to work up to the mic almost as if they're aiming for that safety to cut him off. This Sam, his job, depending on how they're playing, he's probably the he'll, – he'll be the edge player. This play should hit right up here, and now we're forcing this safety to make a tackle. All right? And then here's where I think the RPO game comes in. Right? So now you can block the backside tackle, right? And now you can play an RPO game of a slant or a glance route and see if this safety is going to come up. Yeah. And that's how you're always right. And that's how I think you use the RPO game. You use, you use it against them, but you got to keep it all the same. That way the linebackers can't tell what's really going on. And I think that's what you were talking about earlier, wasn't it, Coach Deweese, with the backside lock on that? Yep. Yep. But, but there's times where we'll just say, screw the RPO tag, and we'll go block the Willie, and now we'll read this defensive end. So let, let, let me ask this question real quick, guys, and, and, and I'm going to wrap up here pretty soon. So one of the things that we started seeing and, um, and, and saw a decent amount of, and we saw it more to the weak side than the front side, you know, we, we would get some on the front side of our zone. But, um, you know, a couple of the, the better teams we played started to the back side they started giving us this. If 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 you know he was gonna basically, he he was gonna be a, a real tight five. He was gonna attack the the via the neck, not necessarily an outside player. And he read the back's action, and as soon as the back went across, he folded in. Um, and and a lot of times they were playing cover one behind it, or they were they would spend a three, um, behind it. But what what it was nice when I went back and looked at it on film, you know, it, it allowed them they they excuse me, they damn near told this backer, you're just playing cleanup. You know, everybody else would would, would have a gap, um, you know, where, where he might be here, say, you know, say he's there. A lot of times he was there, gave him an opportunity to get the front side C. So if it cut in backside A, if we got to, you know, with the offensive line, if we got to him, he was going to fall in and make the play, and it was going to be a two or three yard gain. Um, but but he had the opportunity. Um, Coach, do you ever see uh, much three three stack with too high? We uh, with too high, no, very little. We we would see it a lot. You know, we see it with one high. We don't see it a ton on too high, and if we do, um, it is it's always long down and distance situation. They're giving you the boundary flat and telling you they can make the play for you. Get the sticks. So, anybody ever see this type of scheme where they, they want to fold in the overhang guy? Um, you know, I, four man front will do it. Obviously, you'll have the guy that they want to cover down from an outside gap. But we started seeing a decent amount of it out of um, out of odd fronts. And uh, you know, so obviously part of the the response is instead of locking the tackle, we would just keep him on his zone track. And um, what would end up happening is both these cats would squeeze um, because if, if he got that action, if the tackle didn't turn out, he would stay here and he would squeeze. Um, so it, it gave them a little bit more traditional run fit um, once we started making that adjustment. So I was just curious if anybody else has seen that and has an answer for it. I mean, we definitely, we definitely see it from three, three stack teams. Yep. You know, um, a, a, again, um, some of them have, have been kind of too, too high look, kind of like uh, Coach Mac. I don't know if you've seen, you know, much of his stuff. Um, that that you know, four, two, five principle type stuff. Um, but definitely in the in the 
you know, true three, five look. You see it a lot because most of the time they're playing some kind of pinch loop game, yeah. you know, there with it. So, so listen, I think, I, th- I think, go ahead. What we would do there is we would take the right guard, right tackle, right? I think the, the way I see it is they're going to do something to show that they're doing this. Yep. Right. They're going to stagger step. They're going to do something. But the play side guard, play side tackle, and the why, we would work a three man game. Three man, yeah. Any stunt they want to do, yep. we find with. A lot of times, if they want to do that backside, that bandit or what you have called the J, he's going to have to be super tight. And we would make some sort of call to work that out. But yeah, at the end of the day, we would be around the horn and then we're back to the same deal. Yeah. We would just, we would lock the defensive end and and we would roll with it that way. Uh I think teams that do that are really setting themselves up to get toasted. Uh and anytime they do that, hit them on the outside zone one time out, out the front door and make that safety make a tackle. Because guys, coach, you know, Coach Freeze. You know, Bessie, he said there's only one safety that could ever make that tackle, and his name was Jamal Adams. So, How, how do you guys feel about using an outside receiver to go dig out that play side safety and, and leave the corner on an island? That's kind of a, that's an Alex Gibbs thing. It, 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 it is. Like a push-crack yeah. mentality? Yeah. Uh, that's how you – know, yeah. It's an absolute well, waste to me to stalk a corner when that kid don't want to tackle nobody anyway. I'll send that receiver down in the box and he'll hit as far as he sees. We'll do that. It's more based on – pre-snap alignment so if that safety's flirting down pretty hard mm-hmm. uh pre-snap our receiver will do that but you know we're also i'd say 80 percent of our pass games are po based so we really don't want to do that also when you do push crack uh especially off outside zone a lot of times the receiver's alignment has to be right and you have to teach the receiver hey if push crack is a tag for you you're gonna have to cut down your alignment and and a no huddle offense, that's tough because you're going so fast for the receiver to realize it. We try to stay away from that though sometimes just so we can keep the RPO tag on. We we uh, don't go as fast as, as you guys do, I know with Coach Freeze. I, I know Mike in two thousand eighteen when we first started talking mid zone, um and, and even in two thousand seventeen when we were running buck, we, we told our receivers plays to you we're going to dig the safety out. But we had a rule that when that safety got below the hard deck, if he was below eight yards, it was my job to formation you into position or motion you into position instead of asking you to really show it with your split. Um, and then obviously we tried to also have some things play action wise that gave us a chance um, to, to play action that safety. Um, and, and had some success with that off of our jet sweep this year in particular um, because we, we would use the receivers to always dig out a safety in our jet game. That's why um, I really like the, almost adding the old school veer pass, the front side play action off a stretch look. Yep. And using your sniffer to protect the backside. Um, but I, I'd love that as a compliment if you have that receiver down in there digging them out. You can set up the old post, you know. We 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 ran a good bit of our mid zone away from the tight end, and and this is this is a clip of us running away from tight end. But this is exactly what I was talking about with with Harrison. Um, how that they would, you know, he's there, they're folding him in, and you can see this this linebacker, um, you know, j- just being hella patient. And you'll see as soon as as soon as the tackle turns out and the back goes, the the Viper twenty seven. I mean, he's he's a bat out of hell through the gap right there. Um, and then they obviously shut us down pr- pretty good on this. Um, but but I, I, I'm with you, Coach. I feel like if you're going to use that that tight end on the backside, um, let me see if I can that's, – that's not – we already watched that one. Um, come on. If you, if you can keep the tight end on the backside like right here, um, and, and this is an eight-man front, and passing strength is to the left. Um, so, you know, he, here's here's one of their safeties, and they're actually – they're bracketing a guy on this side because they know who our top guy is. Um, so they've gotten into a kind of a two-high type structure. Um, but it, that's a great opportunity right there, whether we were running to it 
our way, you know, whether we wanted to try to fill this void or fill this void over here. Um, it, it's a great way to do it. And, and there's, I talked to somebody and I don't remember who it was that was essentially taking their four vert principles out of a, like a three by one tray set and, um, and, and running it, but locking the tight end. So instead of getting, you know, the, the opposite hash guy, um, they, they were locking him, leaving him apart. So they ended up with the same read here. And then uh, they verticaled on this side. And I think on this side, I want to say they just ran it like a, like a bang post and they let the quarterback read it off of where the safety was. So he had an option front side and back side. Um, it obviously leaves a lot unblocked on the edge and there's things that they can do that get you in a bind, but it, it has a chance to unlock some explosive plays. I mean, obviously right here, if we're reading play side to the right, you know, that safety, he's capping any glance route that I want to throw. But if I've got a seam by number two to my left over here, I've got an explosive play. Um, so that, that, you know, if, if you're going to, if you're going to RPO outside zone, that, that may be a way to do it. And that makes it easier. I think sometimes and always asking that, um, always asking that, uh, that receiver to dig out the safety. So guys, I appreciate you coming on. Um, we've gone actually longer than I intended to, but I, wow. I know, I, know wow. I got, to, that's what I told myself. Right. And it didn't, it didn't happen. <laughs> um, but I, I, I know, I know I got some good stuff tonight. I've got notes that I've written down. This will be posted uh, tomorrow. Um, I am going to post it on my website. It'll be on the videos page. Um, I've got the one from last week. Um, I've got some old passing game install stuff from 2017 that I did. Um, an old Glazier webinar that I did that's actually talking defense. Um, but I'll go and add that stuff um, to this page. Um, there's a couple of blog posts with some old articles, and I've gone back and forth and talked to some different guys today that have given me some permission to share and, and, and link and post some of their stuff on here as well. So I'm um, just trying to kind of create a resource and consolidate some things that I like and things that I hope other people will like. Um, I appreciate all you guys joining in. I hope you got something. Uh, always feel free to reach out to me. Um, I, I, I'm, you know, I've got some secret sauce, but I don't have a whole lot of it. So I'll share most of what I got. Um, but if, if you'd like cut ups of anything that we run or you want any of our install stuff, I know coach Smith, I saw your message. I got you dog. Don't worry about it. Um, but anybody else, if you want something, get at me. And then, uh, I know there's for sure some guys on here. I know coach Feaster, I know I've hit you up before. Um, you know, Milanis, I know we've certainly talked before and Nichols, I've been trying to copy you for a long time and you've been awfully quiet, but I know, I know what kind of ball you coach. So, um, you know, if I can get anything from you guys, man, I'd love to have it again. I appreciate it. Um, probably going to do another one of these Wednesday. Not sure what my topic is yet. So if you know, you got something you want to hear, shoot me a message on DM and, uh, um, try to make it happen. Thanks again. Coach. Thanks coach. No doubt. Anybody. Thanks got anything? coach. Anybody got anything before we log off? One word play calls Wednesday. One word play calls. I know you would ask for that, man. Let's uh, tell you what. Let's do some thinking on that. And, uh, if we're going to do that one, though, I'm going to make everybody bring something to the table. So, fellas, if you want in on the one word play call stuff, um, come prepared, man. And I'd love to sh for you to share something. I, that's one of my big things is I want to know how do guys teach things and how do they call things and how do they communicate it? That's – hell, I can watch football on Saturday and figure out, oh, that's duo or that's, that's stretch. But I want to know how are you teaching it, how are you calling it, and how are you communicating it. So um, I'd love for you guys to bring something to the party on Wednesday. And let's, uh, let's talk one word play calls and let's go from there. All right, men, have a good evening. Stay healthy, fellas. Sounds good. Thanks, Coach. Thanks, Coach. See you.